Good morning and welcome to CSIS. It's a sign of the times that we talk about Europe and the room is only half full. Um, and it, it is a sign of the times, actually, and you'll see that uh, both in our report and in our commentary on the report, and, uh, and perhaps even uh, you'll see hints of it in the commentary uh, that, uh, that Jim Townsend provides here. Uh, I'm David Berto. I'm the director of our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I particularly want to give special thanks to our commenters, uh, Jim Townsend, who's already here. Steve Flanagan is addressing, I think, something to do with military health care, um, which is, you know, a bigger, bigger than any European country's budget uh, for defense, what we spend on uh, health care alone. Uh, but uh, um, he'll be joining us shortly here. And, uh, um, and I appreciate that. I have one administrative note. I would ask you all to silence your cell phones um, so that they won't interrupt us. We try to actually make it impossible for a signal to penetrate uh, the basement, but sometimes it gets through anyway. I'm going to spend a short period of time going through the report this morning. And then to accommodate the schedules of our commenters, we're going to allow them uh, the time to provide some comments on uh, the report as they've had an opportunity to look at it. Uh, and then after that, we'll throw the floor open to questions and comments from you all as we go forward here. And we'll use our standard procedures. Uh, we've got microphones, and, and we'll ask you to identify yourselves and, and your affiliation before you ask the questions. But we're pretty open otherwise. Uh, defense analysis is, is never very easy, and uh, in the U.S. we've actually gotten spoiled because we've got good access to data, both on spending and on trends and on breaking that down. We have a lot of constancy over time. We have a lot of public visibility. Some of that is thanks to our executive legislative branch interface uh, because it requires everybody to put good data on the table and to track it over time. But that's not true in other parts of the world. And in fact, it's very difficult to get good data and to get constancy over time and to get comparability across countries. And so uh, a number of years ago, we undertook here at the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group an effort to do a thorough examination of European defense spending. And that really required us to create our own database in order to do that. And I actually want to give thanks to our um, uh, the seminal work that was done by our research consultant in uh, 2007, um, uh, Wan Jung Chao, who, without whose work this would not have ever happened and we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, I also want to recognize the enormous contributions that were done uh, by our lead author, Joachim Hofbauer. Is he here, Joachim? Yes, he's standing in the back corner still uh, making sure that everything is squared away here, as well as the uh, uh, contributing authors uh, Gregory Sanders and, and Roy Levy, and uh, a host of others who contributed to this process as it went through, particularly uh, my deputy, Guy Benari, who was with me, was the co-project director here. It is an enormous technical challenge to pull the data together. Uh, there, there is no common data definition. There's no common data dictionary. NATO and the EU count differently, both uh, uh, within a country and across Europe. Uh, but we've been able to pull together what we believe is the most comprehensive uh, view available on European defense spending. And we've gone beyond that. Um, let's see. I have, I actually have some uh, view graphs, but more importantly, you have the report. Does everybody have a copy of the report with you? I will refer you to the charts as I'm talking about them so that you'll be able to find them and, uh, and come into play here. Um, we open with an analysis of European defense spending because that's what we've done in our previous reports here. But early last year, we began tracking the implementation and the effects of some additional uh, activities, not the least of which is the EU directives on procurement and transfers. Um, and we think that that regulatory framework and the changes in the regulatory framework in Europe um, have enormous potential impact for the future, uh, both of defense in Europe and for the U.S. relations there. Uh, at both the uh, strategic level and at the defense industry level. And this led us to questions of impacts on industry, and so we've actually uh, created our own framework of analysis for industry as well. Let me ask you to look at the chart on page two. 
And I'll go through these fairly quickly so that we can get to our comments and our questions. There's uh, a couple of surprising elements of, in, our, in our results, uh, but the overall picture is not surprising at all. You can see the blue dotted line there shows that European defense spending is down over the entire decade. And uh, this is all in constant 2009 euros, so that we've got uh, comparability over time and across countries. But essentially, you've got almost a 2% per year decline in overall defense spending in European countries. Um, we expect that trend to continue in 2010, based on the announcement so far, like the UK's uh, SDRS last, late last month, uh, and, uh, and others are probably in line to come. The more surprising thing is the red line. Because over 2001 to 2009, spending per soldier, and we use soldier here for military personnel, even though we're not just restricting it to the, the Army, is actually up. And it's up on average 2.8% per year. Uh, this was probably not by design. It's by default. It happened. It happened because in strength reductions were greater than defense spending cuts. But overall, it actually does provide both an opportunity and, in some cases, the reality of an increased focus on the technological capability on a per-soldier basis. Um, let me ask you then to look at the chart on page 5, because the second surprising trend is one that runs counter to the U.S. experience when defense spending is going down. And that is that the cuts have been less in the investment accounts than they have in the personnel and the infrastructure accounts. Typically, of course, in the U.S., and this is true both in the post-Vietnam drawdown in the 1970s and in the post-Cold War drawdown of the 1990s, we take a disproportionate share of our cuts in investment accounts, in, in procurement and R&D. And, uh, and we tend to protect infrastructure and force structure and civilian jobs uh, greater than we do the um, uh, expenditures on procurement and R&D. The reverse has been true in Europe over the course of uh, the first half of, uh, or the first decade of this century. Uh, equipment reductions have been less than half of overall defense spending cuts, and uh, uh, O&M and operations, in part because of deployments overseas, have been protected to an even greater degree. Look on page seven at the chart. On a per soldier basis, all the categories are up, except for facilities. I don't believe that's because the facilities were so modern and up to date that they required no additional investment. I think it's because force structure cuts are so great that we can uh, abandon a, a number of places. Similarly, on page seven, you'll see the distribution uh, by the NATO budget categories. Now, NATO doesn't break out R&D separately, and so we have to do our own uh, manipulation to get R&D. But here again, you'll see over time, and these are in constant euros, uh, uh, O&M and other is up from 20 billion euros to 23.6 billion by 2009. Uh, equipment up from 15.7, that's at the bottom, to 19 billion. Personnel is down a bit, not surprising because personnel cuts were over a million in uh, numbers, and facilities down a little bit. Um, turn back to page three. This is a complex map that gives you defense spending by country. Um, the size of the circle is the spending per soldier. So the ones with bigger circles have uh, higher levels of euros per soldier. The density of the color of the country, that is the very dark green ones, is total spending. So not surprisingly, uh, the UK, France, uh, Germany, Italy are at the top of that list in terms of overall defense spending. Inside the countries that have multiple colors, some of them you see are just sort of a plain orange, which is uh, the, the data are not available to be broken down by category. But inside the ones where the, you have colored wedges, the, uh, the blue wedge is actually equipment spending. And you can see a, a very, and the data are all buried in here, but this gives you a good quick visual image. You can see the countries that have a higher percentage of expenditure on equipment. And not surprisingly, it's again Germany, France, the UK, although at the smaller level, at the smaller country level, there are some interesting things there. There is, we believe, a result of all of this, a huge opportunity for specialization. Now, Europe has talked a lot about specialization. In fact, I think when I first came to town 30 years ago, what were the realities? NATO wasn't spending enough. No European country was living up to its commitments. And we needed greater specialization in order to take full advantage of the capability that would be available to us and mesh it with a global strategy that the US, had the U.S. at the center. That same discussion is still underway today. It's just the framework of it is all fundamentally different, and the numbers are pitiful in comparison to what we used to be talking about. Um, but if you look uh, at, uh, at page 12, at chart 8, here I'm going to pull up my, my own uh, book and make sure that I'm 
looking at the same thing that I'm talking about. You'll see an array, and the, uh, the array here, the, the uh, vertical axis is in fact total defense spending. So, and that's uh, on a, on a uh, in billions of euros. Um, the UK and France and Germany are obviously high. Southern Europe, which is uh, I Italy, Spain, uh, combined together is at, at the highest. Um, on the uh, horizontal axis, you have uh, a combined annual growth rate, and you see that most countries um, ha adjusted for inflation haven't grown very much, but all have grown a little bit. It's really been the non-aligned Eastern Europe countries and Southern Europe where the reductions have been uh, the greatest. Uh, UK, France, and Germany down a little bit. Now, this obviously doesn't incorporate the latest UK uh, data in it. Uh, and so if you take out there, uh, they'll move a little bit to the left there. On the next page, uh, page 14, chart 10, you see on the, on the defense equipment spending by region. And again, the, the zero line in the middle um, is not the European aggregate. The European aggregate is the 0.9 percent. That's the heavy dark vertical line. And so you see that you have a number of places that are above average, a number that are below average. That's a quick snapshot of the spending picture, if you will. That led us to then step back and think about the market as a whole. And I mentioned that about uh, early last year, we began tracking a number of, uh, of directives that were being issued. Um, in fact, if you'll turn to uh, page 24, you'll see a quick summary of this. And I want to walk you through three key recent initiatives here. Uh, the first one is the, the lower left-hand side, the interpretative communication on Article 296. This is the exception inside uh, NATO regulations that allow, uh, I mean, EU regulations that allow for countries to essentially make non-competitive awards in order to protect domestic supply. And it's an exception that has not been used as an exception, but has been, by and large, the rule in most procurement. In fact, if you, uh, if you look back on page 41, uh, you'll see a chart that shows the total revenue or in expenditures, and you'll see the vast majority is in-country, uh, roughly two-thirds to, to three-fourths uh, of spending is on in-country companies This is and in-country jobs. This is not a surprise. This is what you would expect. This is what Europe has done for a long time. Um, but the emphasis now in recent years has been to reduce that and to make it truly an exception rather than the standard rule. Um, there's a test case right now involving uh, the Czech Republic, uh, which we will find out whether or not there's actually teeth behind this uh, to, to essentially stand up to an exception uh, that's not warranted and not justified. That in and of itself is remarkable enough, but it might become more remarkable because of the two directives that were issued. Uh, one is the EU procurement directive, that's the, uh, the upper left item there, uh, which basically uh, particularly designed to create greater competition across uh, countries and across companies for procurement decisions and to, again, reduce the exceptions and provide for more competition. And then on the upper right, the uh, directive on transfers, uh, which fundamentally has at its core an opportunity for a single license for uh, export across all of Europe. And the potential here is that once you've qualified, you no longer have to get new licenses for, for uh, any particular, particularly different activities. Um, depending on what the U.S. does in response to this, this could end up creating an advantage for European companies for inter-European uh, uh, defense contracts and a disadvantage for U.S. companies who won't necessarily be subject to that. We're going to have to watch that as it's played out. Now, how will this play out? I mean, typically, um, you know, there's lots of, of great words about less domestic focus and greater increase on competition and on uh, taking advantage of technology or even on looking at opportunities for specialization. But history says that we haven't taken advantage of those opportunities when they've come around. The question is, will today be any different? In order to set ourselves up for that question, we also want to look at what happens with the industry. Um, we created our own index, a, a uh, European um, Security, Defense, and Space Index. And the list of companies uh, that are in that index is in the back on, on page 56. But if you look at page 35 and 36, you'll see sort of the results of what we've done. What we wanted to do was to have an ability to look at the performance of European defense companies vis-a-vis -vis their non-defense industrial counterparts. 
And so we used the Morgan Stanley Capital Investment Europe Industrials as the benchmark, and we compared our own index against those. And I just want to quickly walk you through the results of that. On page 35, you'll see that on, uh, on a pure EBIT margin comparison uh, that the, the, our European index generally outperforms uh, the core uh, industrials in Europe, so they're doing a little better. On cash flow ROI, uh, which is on page 36, they're consistently better than their uh, industrial counterparts. So that tells us that the European defense industry over the decade of the aughts is pretty healthy. It did okay even as defense spending was going down. What about the future? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can think about the future. One is um, what kind of R&D expenditures have the companies received from their governments? And the second is what are they doing with their own internal uh, R&D investment? Because where you put your investment is likely to be where you think your, your future is. So if you look at page 37, you'll see that R&D is a percentage of revenue. By and large, the defense index outperforms the basic industrials. So as a percent of revenue, they're spending more on R&D. And then on page 38, uh, from a, a capital investment point of view, again, uh, with a couple of exceptions, by and large, the index outperforms the industrials. This says that European defense companies are actually thinking they still have a future, notwithstanding the 1.8 percent annual decline in revenue. Turn back to page 33, and you'll see why they think this. Revenue mix by geographic origin. In 2003, uh, roughly two-thirds of all the revenue from, the, from uh, the companies in our index came from Europe itself, with a, a smaller portion from North America and the rest of the world. By 2009, which is the last year for which we have data, you'll see that, in fact, Europe has been relatively flat, North America has roughly doubled, and the rest of the world has gone up even greater. And so what this says is the companies have done very, very well, but they've done well not by selling in Europe, but by selling to us and to the rest. And of course, many of you are represented here in this room. So you already knew that at the company level. You probably didn't know it overall. What does this mean over time? We think that there is at least the potential for the budget declines to continue to be offset by troop reductions. European armies across the board have more than a million men and women in uniform than the US does. There's still an enormous opportunity for that. You see it in the German white paper. Uh, the potential for a move away from uh, conscription force to a smaller uh, professional force, um, and that trend could easily continue. The key will be whether or not we take advantage of that opportunity to create greater specialization, which could in fact allow us to both retain or even enhance overall capability, and or whether or not we just downsize in place and protect domestic jobs with a consequent loss in capability across Europe. That's somewhat independent of national decisions because global financial markets will in part determine whether or not that technology capability is there. If the companies no longer are competitive, they'll have a little more difficulty uh, with access to capital. Overall, the government and the industry responses will determine the regulatory reform impact. This is really a question of how governments implement and whether or not the cost is more important than protecting domestic jobs. Because ultimately, the competitive market will, in fact, allow European countries to have greater capability for the dollar or the euros they're going to have. But if they're not careful, they'll end up protecting jobs at an increasing cost. Um, defense market, I think, we think supports greater international involvement. This is not only a financial question. This is a technology question and a capability question. So our recommendations are, our strong recommendations are that there's a huge NATO interest, there's a huge EU interest, most importantly, there's a huge US interest in maintaining the spending trends of increases on a per soldier basis. But more importantly, in focusing that spending on greater specialization and enhanced capability. Um, that's been by default up to now. It could be by design. The U.S. clearly has a strong vested interest in doing so. The question is, can we take advantage of that vested interest and actually create an encouragement for that? From the regulatory reform point of view, there's an enormous opportunity to integrate the market. This would both provide greater capability for the same amount of spending and provide for greater technology development uh, from European defense industrial base. There's probably an opportunity to create a broader European defense industrial base strategy. There's a lot of talk about this. There has been talk about this for decades. That opportunity is greater now than it's been before. 
And in some ways, the economic recession that we find ourselves in creates an opportunity here because recovery opens options that, in fact, wouldn't have been there had we had a stable opportunity. So the U.S. needs to weigh in, needs to encourage specialization, needs to recognize the opportunity of the per-soldier spending, and needs to have a corresponding effort to continue on our own export control reforms so that as the EU directives on transfers takes effect, uh, we've got a corresponding opening of the market here. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and you can hold your questions. We'll get uh, after the end of our commenters, and, uh, and we'll provide that opportunity as well. So uh, with that, I will uh, ask uh, that uh, Jim Townsend, who's our DASD for Europe in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and who was a collaborator with us in his time at the Atlantic Council on previous European defense spending reports that we had, for which we're grateful. And uh, Jim, you've got an op had an opportunity, I think, to look at this, and we look forward to your comments. So I'll turn the microphone over to you. Well, David, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to take part in this. Uh, again, as, as, he, as David pointed out, uh, when CSIS first rolled out this report a couple of years ago, I was part of that rollout then. And I will say, David, that when we rolled out the first uh, copy of this, it was one of your smaller rooms upstairs, and we had maybe 10 people in the audience. So, so this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good increase, but the point's well taken uh, about the um, – uh, the importance that we need to, to, to pay uh, to this, this kind of data. And, uh, and, I, and I would like to say to David and to CSIS uh, and all your collaborators that this, was, this is an important work that comes out each year. And each year it gets better and better. Uh, there's, um, there's a great need in the community on the outside of government to drill down and to look at these types of things. It's done somewhat in government, but it's not done, I think, as as thoroughly as CSIS uh, does, uh, does their report. And so I'm always glad to see this come out every year. Uh, and it's, it's really a value to me in looking at it. I'm going to have my uh, remarks kind of in two, in, in two buckets, if you will. One is the so what of this, which I always try to apply to everything that, that I take a look at is, you know, particularly for statistics, statistics and business trends and that type of thing, because I'm a Paul Mill guy. I could never have done the advanced math that David, I'm sure, did in his, uh, in his past educational career. So what I have to do is the Paul Mill guys take a look at this and say, well, so what does this mean for me? What, 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 how do I use this? And David got into that as he was talking about what the U.S. government and what NATO needs to do. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The so what? And then I'm, I want to talk a little bit about um, what I'm seeing, what we're all seeing right now, uh, in terms of not just trends, but this bit of a, but a, a bit of a freefall, if you will, as nations begin to grapple with uh, the, the deficits that we all have, and we go through and do reforms uh, in terms of government spending, particularly on, on in the defense side. And there's not a capital in the alliance uh, that is that is immune from this. Uh, everyone is making cuts. Uh, some big, uh, some not as big. We know about the UK. It's been in the news quite a bit recently, particularly the UK-French um, approach, joint approach. Uh, and uh, and so uh, we, we need to talk about that as well. And and just to just to start off, I guess a little bit on that particular bucket, the um, looking at what we're seeing. You know, I uh, I collect books, and I have. Uh, uh, a book that I bought a few years ago, which is really interesting. It's a yearbook for 1913. And what it is, is one of the British newspapers put it out, and it talks about all the news events and the personalities of 1913. And it's really interesting because obviously 1913 is right before uh, Europe was engulfed in, in war. In fact, this, this uh, 1913 book came out in about, I guess it came out about January, February 1914 just months before. So when you go through 1913, knowing what we know now, it's, it's interesting to see the little hints here and there. Uh, I think, um, you know, one of the pages was devoted to singing the praises of Kaiser Wilhelm, as a matter of fact, that of, you know, as a statesman and this type of thing. And so it was interesting to watch this and to get in the minds of those in 1913 and the events of 1913, right before uh, the First World War began. In some ways, uh, this is like 1913, because the, the reason I say that is the, uh, in terms of looking at the data. The data here is from 2009. Um, it's showing it's, it's so well uh, the trends uh, and, and what was happening in 2009, but it's come out um, 
right before we went into this, uh, I call it a free fall, but we went into this incredible restructuring and reorganization that we're in the middle of right now, and we're not sure how it will end. So David, when you put this out next year, it's going to be very interesting, very interesting to see uh, what, um, what the impact has been. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing that because um, in a couple of ways we're wrestling with, um, the, we're wrestling with this, with the defense spending uh, trends that are now taking hooks that we didn't see last year. We got hints, but certainly they're, they're big right now. Uh, and how that then ripples into uh, business and into uh, what is what nations not only going to be willing to spend, but what are they going to spend it on? It's going to be fascinating because you 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 have that aspect of what the government policy is in terms of defense spending, but you've got requirements like Afghanistan, uh, where where uh, where all the nations in the, of the alliance are doing something there, and many of them have uh, lots of troops there. They're using up lots of equipment. Uh, that's got to be, you know, uh, replaced or refurbished. Uh, we know we're going, uh, we, we're learning lessons from Afghanistan that's leading to upgrades and, and different views on how one acquires capability or the kinds of capabilities that you need. Uh, and so it's a, um, it's, it's, it's going to, it's, it's, a, it's a time where uh, somehow we're going to have to square this circle of meeting capability requirements just in terms of replacing kit. Uh, and training and this type of thing because of Afghanistan and other operations too, whether it's piracy or whatever it might be for naval vessels, uh, with, this, uh, with the cut in, um, in, in spending. Um, at NATO as well, we ran into, in this year, in 2010, a problem that NATO hasn't had to have before, and that is in terms of common funds. I won't go into all the budgeting and the types of things that NATO does. I'm sure most of you are aware that, uh, that uh, much of NATO spending is done uh, through a common pot that the nations put in funding uh, by percentage. And a lot of this money in these days are going to help fund uh, NATO operations in Afghanistan. The requirement this year, just in January uh, of this year, was so great that we uh, spent the common funds within the first uh, couple of months of the fiscal year. So we outstripped the estimates that were made uh, the year before in terms of budgeting. And so at NATO, over the past year, we've gone through a big reform effort to try to get uh, the cost and the expense down of running the alliance and try to channel the money into the highest priorities. And I can tell you that that was difficult work. Uh, we had um, political directors from capitals come in. Uh, during the winter of this year, uh, and we sat and we reformed the way NATO did, does budgeting, the way it does estimates, the way it, it spends it out, how it prioritizes. Uh, we try to um, do a lot of groundwork to better estimate what our needs are for next year. Uh, you would think that we <laughs> You would think we'd be doing that anyway, but uh, but but in the past, NATO had the luxury of of uh, of missions uh, that were not at that point outstripping what nations were putting into the common funds. It was a, it was a different day, if you will, and uh, this year uh, we 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 found the 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 uh, the um, trend lines crossing, and in fact, we had to go and get a supplement from nations to plus back up the the budget for this year, and so. Uh, as a result of that, you will see at the Lisbon Summit uh, in January, um, not in January, the Lisbon Summit in a few weeks, uh, reform packages that include not just uh, the, these, uh, these budget reforms that NATO is doing, uh, but a couple of other things too. One is uh, the so-called Lisbon uh, Critical Capabilities Commitment. And what that is, unlike past summits and uh, and approaches where NATO was, has had the Defense Capabilities Initiative, where we had nations try to uh, purchase, uh, you know, uh, uh, capability to meet shortfalls uh, from scratch, if you will. These ten projects that are in the Lisbon Capabilities Commitment have already been agreed. They're in the pipeline. They're being worked at NATO. And what we want uh, heads of state and government to do is to pledge that, despite the uh, the this. Uh, these uh, cuts and reforms nationally in terms of spending that we will fully fund and take across the goal line these projects. They involve counter IED, they involve uh, cyber, they involve missile defense. Um, they, are, they are important uh, initiatives that NATO has already agreed to undertake, has already partially funded, many of them. 
but that we've got to make sure survive whatever happens in terms of common funds and in terms of national funds that might have to go into these programs. So we've, we've, uh, we've uh, fenced off these to, to make sure that they, they, that they remain. Um, you'll also see a, um, a blueprint for a generic command structure, and this was something that was uh, revolutionary in a lot of ways. We started with a blank sheet of paper at NATO on what the command structure should look like to come up with a command structure that is fit for purpose in terms of what we want the alliance to do um, in the coming 10 years, along with the new strategic concept, but to do it more affordably than we've done in the past. We're still in the middle of that work. We hope that heads of state and government will uh, approve this blueprint, and then we'll have to take on additional work after Lisbon. But these are examples of what uh, NATO is doing as an institution trying to deal with these cuts. Um, and uh, David talked about specialization, and I'm going to get to that in, in a second as well. But, but what we're seeing, obviously, within an alliance context in terms of the institution and how it goes about its work, and what we're seeing in nations um, is, this, is this grappling with a uh, – we saw the trends earlier, uh, and a lot of them are in here, but we're grappling with this, this deficit situation that has really burst on the scene this year in terms of impact on defense spending and trying then to, to uh, couple that with needed requirements coming out of real-world operations, particularly in Afghanistan. Uh, now, how can we, how can we go about, in a, in a new way, uh, deal with these, uh, um, deal with these, uh, this, this deficit situation and this spending, ways that um, are, are creative? And going back to what David said and going back to the report, this is an opportunity for us to do on a national basis as well as at NATO to do things that we know uh, should have been done years ago, whether it's NATO budgeting or the command structure or or conscription in Germany, or the way the UK does things, this is this is an opportunity for us to go about and make changes and to do things because we have to. We've got a fiscal bayonet to our back, if you will, saying we've got to do a smarter job in how we go about spending this money. Um, David mentioned specialization. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I could just so I keep saying that, so I remember to. Uh, but I think in, in a lot of ways what the UK and France have decided to do a few days ago is an example of, of uh, the situation causing a, a cooperative approach that is, that, that is actually is something that's not necessarily new. Uh, if you look at how allies have cooperated in the past, whether it's the Netherlands and Belgium, the US and Canada, um, uh, there's, a, there's, there's examples of um, the Nordic nations, there, there are a lot of examples uh, of how uh, due to perhaps specialization in some ways, but, but due to size, due to an affinity in terms of nations working together, uh, it, was, uh, it, it was the common sense approach uh, to deploying forces. You know, when, the, when uh, forces were deployed to Italy to do the air campaign, as I remember, Belgium and the Netherlands deployed together their F-16s. And uh, so, I mean, it, this isn't necessarily something new, this kind of cooperation, but I think what is new um, and even the French and the UK have cooperated in the past, I think. You could probably find examples. But what's new here is the scale and the depth of it and, and the new areas that they're exploring in a lot of ways. And so I think, uh, I think what the UK and, fr and France have done, they're pointing the way uh, to, uh, both uh, within an alliance context as well as on a bilateral basis. They're pointing the way towards a smart way for nations to try to keep the capability up even as the money spent on capability uh, is, is going down. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, that type of cooperation is difficult, what France and the UK are doing. I, I'm wishing them all, all the best, and we're going to be watching and helping where we can, but it is, it's going to be important uh, that, they, that they are successful. I think um, other nations are watching closely, too, because I think there's a lot of ways in which we can operate together in an efficient and effective way, an affordable way, keeping that capability up. Um, specialization. You know, uh, as an old defense planner uh, at NATO, back in the 90s when I was doing defense planning there, we, we talked quite a bit about role specialization, uh, pooling of forces, um, you know, that type of thing. In a sense, what UK, uh, UK and France are doing now, and you could, you could cause some of that pooling or that type of thing. We'll have to see the details and how it works out, but, but we've talked about this in the past. Um, a lot of this is common sense, it, it, you know, uh, combat service support or whatever, uh, you can name other specializations too. Um, 
it, you know, having a nation or a handful of nations specialize in that type of thing or pooling uh, bits of capability that individual nations have together to create a larger pool of that of, of a capability. That's a lot of, that's common sense. I mean, we do it in our own lives in various ways. Um, there are downsides to that too. Um, if you've got uh, a nation that has specialized in something, water purification, whatever it might be, and NATO is going off on a mission and, and uh, that nation says, you know, look, we'll, 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 we're with you on, on the mission, but we're not going to participate in it for whatever reason it might be. Then are you going to scramble around and have to find water, purific uh, water pur purifiers, if you will? Uh, that's, a, that's a very simple example, but it's something that you have to think about in, in creating a dependency on nations uh, for, for important uh, uh, capabilities uh, when um, whether those capabilities will be used is a political decision that nations have to make. And if they, for whatever reason, going another direction, then you, then you find yourself having to scramble. Um, but I think what's happening here, David, and, and you point this out, is there's an opportunity and a necessity to uh, approach this kind of thinking and, 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 and uh, agree that there's downsides to these things. But is there, not an, is there not a necessity here for us to think more thoroughly about it and say, well, are there some workarounds here? Are there some uh, role specializations that, in fact, um, uh, we, we, we've got to do despite the risks that in fact lend themselves. So there's some things that really do lend themselves to be specialized uh, that, uh, that we've got to, um, um, we've got to pursue and be smart about, uh, be smart about. Now I will say as far, David was saying that uh, you know, the U.S. has got to jump in and, um, and, uh, and lead the way in a lot of ways in terms of the opportunities here. I think you'll see that happening after the Lisbon summit in the sense that in terms of defense planning, in terms of how the alliance will then implement the new strategic concept in terms of, okay, here we've got the concept. We know where uh, our uh, hesitating government wants us to go. How are we going to do that? Obviously, the alliance is going to have to do a lot of that implementation work after Lisbon and sort that out in this um, fiscally constrained uh, environment that we're in. So as we do the various documents, ministerial guidance, things like that, that will then uh, task out work, um, I believe, and what we will do, uh, because that's what I work doing, um, we will inject into the defense planning process the need to really look hard at this. You know, we have allies who are still um, building capabilities. They are uh, coming from, um, coming from a, a, a background where um, uh, the, the, their military forces were shaped in, in a certain way, uh, perhaps during the Cold War. They're now being shaped uh, in, in other ways that are more towards, the, the, of course, the way NATO does business, uh, the interoperability, et cetera. We've been doing that since the 90s. Uh, but it might be some of these nations um, might want to might want to focus on a specialization, and we've got to figure out if that, in fact, makes a lot of sense in the NATO context. And, and, we're, and, and, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do that because there is an opportunity, like we've seen with these reforms at NATO, that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. There is an opportunity to, to, do, to make the hard decisions when you have to because of the financial resources, and there is a, a need to... Uh, there is a need to be more creative. And I'll tell you a creative approach that the Alliance took uh, over a couple of years that is, sets the standard, and that's the C-17 Consortium, or the SAC, I guess it's called now. Um, and I think that C-17 Consortium where nations bought flight hours uh, was absolutely brilliant. It was hard making it work, although I have to say it happened more quickly than AGS or other kinds of things. <laughs> But it worked, and, uh, but, but of course that kind of approach works only with certain, in certain specialties. It doesn't work across the board for everything. But, it, I, but it, gave, it gives us an example, though, of an approach that's new. It's not like NATO AWACS or AGS or ACTS or all the other programs that have taken a long time to, uh, to, to come to fruition. This happened pretty quickly. It was very creative. And it's this kind of thing, David, I think, that we've got to look for as we are in this new era of fiscal constraints and we try to grab on to the opportunities that are there. Um, well, what's, what, is, what does this mean for business? Um, and, and, and I think it's really, we, we are going to need business to help, help show the way on how we can be more creative. Um, it's you all face the same kind of problems we have from a different side of it, but, but as far as, as, the, uh, as, far as the, um, the transatlantic industrial concerns, 
uh, the, 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 the businesses. If we can't find creative approaches to acquiring uh, um, capabilities, uh, I, I, I think business is going to be in a, in a, in a, in a in, in, business will not be doing as much as it could be doing. Mm -hmm. It's complicated work, and if it's left up to NATO, up to the CNAD, up to NATO committees, or up to individual nations, my office, other people, if it's left up to us to come up with these creative approaches, um, the, the frenetic pace that we are involved in and the broad array of issues we're dealing with don't necessarily leave time for us to sit down and think up something like the C-17 consortium. I think it really it's, a, it's something, it's a partnership between the nations uh, and NATO and uh, 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 well, between the nations and, and NATO and business, it's a, it's a three-legged stool, if you will, that we've got to think this through together. And, and I know we talk about that. We've talked about that for years. I've come to CSIS many times and talked about that. But this time, the financial situation is such that we have to do this. Um, we've got to come up with, with creative approaches. And I really do believe in, in, industry can be a great help on this. I think, uh, I think you all probably see more clearly than we do the imperatives. And the motivation certainly is there, too, in terms of making sales and, and that type of thing. So somehow, we've got to come up with an, an intersection where this three-legged stool of nations, NATO, and business can sort this out. I think NATO obviously has the, uh, the NIAG and other um, uh, committees that, that, that are supposed to do that. NATO EU should be doing this. The EU defense uh, arm uh, has capability shortfalls too that are going to be harder to try to fill uh, as uh, nations are not, aren't spending the money there. So, um, so David, I think frankly uh, this, is, this is an imperative for NATO and the EU as well on an industrial side. European Defense Agency, I mean, we've said this how many times? I think we've got to do it now uh, to come up with uh, this uh, industrial approach, uh, uh, working with industry, NATO EU, to, to come up with, with C-17-like uh, uh, approaches to helping us meet uh, shortfalls. We just have to. Um, I'm going to wrap up real quick, David, uh, and, and head out for yet another meeting. but. Um, the so what bucket, that was all about the what's happening now bucket, the so what bucket of your study. Um, I think there's a lot of so what here. Um, in fact, uh, if I was still at the Atlantic Council, I would come over and say, can we help you guys write the so what part of this? On, on what does this mean? And I'll just, I'm going to draw out just, uh, with just one example. Um, when you look at page three and you look at the European defense spending um, by the map, um, and, you, and, you, and you combine the statistics and the things that, that go into the circles that are on the map, and you think about, but then you put your Paul Mill hat on and you look at this and you, you know, you, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, that, that uh, the story isn't all there, obviously, because this, you're doing a specific thing, but if you put your Paul Mill hat on, um, I look at Sweden as an example. If you look at Sweden, um, it's got a pretty big circle there. This, ca this category breakdown is unavailable, so, so you're not quite sure where it's being spent. But I, but, but I use Sweden as an example uh, that you can use for all the countries there. It's not necessarily um, the amount of money and where it's being spent that says it all. It's also um, how smart is this money being spent? And I, and I know you said that, and you're absolutely right. It's how smart is it being spent. When you look at Sweden, um, I've been watching Sweden over many years, having been the for, former Swedish desk officer many years ago, but watching the evolution of the Swedish defense forces once they got into the European Union and got into the defense side of the EU as that developed after San Malo and Sweden became involved in the battle groups, it had to change its uh, force structure to be able to take on those kinds of missions because Sweden was in a whole other place in 1990. You fast forward a number of years, and the way they have spent the money, that circle there, has been very important in terms of being expeditionary, acquiring capabilities they didn't have before because that wasn't where they were in the total defense days. Uh, now they are quite a different force and a very effective one and a very important one. So for me, I look at that circle and I think I, I, I know a lot of goodness is, is in that circle and change. It doesn't come out uh, unless you put that Paul Mill hat on. And I think um, uh, for the next uh, iteration of this, it would be great to have a Paul Mill view of, okay, what's the so what of that circle? Um, for me, that circle with Sweden is, is an important circle, and so I could say something similar about a lot of the circles here and, and how the monies are being spent. Um, 
and uh, and so uh, I, uh, I, 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 maybe we should meet in six months and we can come and take a look at the, the Paul Mill implications of, of all of this. Anyway, it's a, it's an important work that we have in front of us, and I, uh, and I, and I'm so happy that CSIS is continuing to do this. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it next um, next year as we look at the impact. And, and frankly, it's not next year; it's five years from now. What kind of force structure are we going to have within the transatlantic community after all the reforms have taken place? Um, as David said, and it's true. As nations reform and cut defense spending, it doesn't have to be, if you will, uh, all in the negatives. Uh, there could be reforms that are forced by monies being cut that, in fact, produce that, in fact, fix problems that have been there all along. Like I said at NATO, uh, that we've been able to do that, and uh, and so I think it could be as we look at this five to ten years from now. Um, you have a lot of doomsayers saying we're going to have nothing but a hollow force. We don't want that. We've got to be careful about that. As we do these, these cutbacks, we have to make sure we do them in a coordinated fashion at NATO so that we don't inadvertently end up with a, a, a cupboard uh, that's nothing but combat service support five years from now. We've got to be able to do this in a smart way in terms of the alliance. And NATO is going to have to pick that up as an imperative after Lisbon is to see where we are. But David, I think five years from now, ten years from now, as we look at the long-term implications of what's happening now, um, I think this is going to be a fascinating document, and this map will be very interesting. And I hope what we can do, whether it's in a, an alliance context, whether it's NATO-EU, whether it's in a national context, I hope that what we can do is take advantage of the opportunities, David, that you said are there, and I agree. If we can take advantage of the opportunities that are also there at, at a period of reform, um, at a period of reform that is that is a essential reform, one that's that's pushed by politics, that if we can guide it and we can work together and we can we can make sure that the that the monies that we spend, even though a smaller amount, are spent in a smarter way, are spent in a way that enhances cooperation to keep capabilities higher, uh, as high as they were when there was money. France, UK example, uh, right there. If we're able to do that, the picture doesn't have to be in five or ten years one of smaller uh, and less capable hollow forces. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, in fact, we could come away with some problems fixed and some en some enhancements. The only issue that I'm going to be watching very cl well, not the only issue, but one that particularly concerns me is to make sure that. Um, as we get smaller, we don't impact the sustainability of an operation. As the numbers of ground forces particularly get smaller, that uh, while they might be more capable, spending per soldier goes up, and in fact it's in areas that it's not just a statistical anomaly, but in fact it's done with uh, on purpose. It's done in a way to improve capability per soldier. Um, even with that, the smaller numbers means there's less of the more capable soldiers. Uh, it's less of the it's you, our ability to sustain operations and to um, handle con concurrent operations, two or three or four different operations happening at the same time. That's what concerns me the most. As you know, when you get smaller, your ability to do two or three or four things at one time um, becomes harder to do. And I, that's what I worry about. And, and we'll see how this evolves over time. Uh, and we'll watch very carefully how nations who are also concerned about that, certainly, how they deal with it, France, UK is an example, how the alliance deals with that, uh, this, 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 this making sure that, that we keep not just the quality up there, but somehow deal with the ability to handle the sustainment and concurrency issues where, you, where it's nice to have a larger force to be able to handle things that happen together, whether it's a battle group over here and a NATO operation over there and a national requirement here. That's a, that's, that can be a big uh, challenge for nations whose forces have gotten smaller, even though more capable, but they've gotten smaller. So lots of things to, to look at. Uh, thank you so much for, for allowing me to come and give some, give some views. And, uh, look for, and I, I think you're going to have a very interesting morning of discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Stephen Flanagan. Uh, Dr. Flanagan is the Kissinger Chair here at CSIS, and he has, I was going to say a long career, but that implies that he's old, and so I'm not going to say a long career. He has had a very dynamic and, and uh, ubiquitous career across both the interagency DOD and the academic community here, and we've asked him to provide some additional commentary this morning. I would like to thank Jim Townsend uh, as he's walking out the door as well uh, for his taking time out. 
from his schedule to uh, be here with us today. Thank you, Jim. Steve? Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, sorry to join you a little bit late. I did hear uh, Jim's remarks, and I've uh, had the opportunity to read this uh, great report several times. So I'm, uh, I hope to not, not repeat things you've already heard, but uh, we had another event going on upstairs. Um, I like that uh, ubiquitous invitation, uh, in, in introduction. I, uh, my father just says I can't hold on a steady job, so I keep changing my location in Washington before they catch up with me. But um, first of all, I just want to say uh, it's been a real privilege uh, to um, be on the sidelines of this study. I think uh, David and Guy and his team in our Defense Industrial Initiatives group have really produced a, a very impressive piece of work that uh, I think if you, if those of you who've had a chance to take a look at it, uh, pulls together an enormous uh, array of data uh, in a very readable uh, and, and graphically interesting and appealing way. So if you haven't got a copy of the report, I hope you will uh, pick one up on, on the way out. Um, it comes, of course, as, as Jim alluded to it, at an important time uh, with a number of National Defense Reviews uh, having just uh, been completed, uh, most recently the UK uh, Strategic Defense and Security Review, uh, but also on the eve of the NATO summit uh, and uh, the uh, uh, finalization of a new strategic concept for the alliance, which will uh, be adopted in, uh, on the 19th and 20th of, uh, of this month in Lisbon and setting some clear goals and direction for the future kind of force structure that NATO uh, feels that it uh, is most appropriate to the emerging security environment and setting some goals uh, in an era of austerity that it recognized will be very difficult for a number of member countries to, uh, to uh, achieve. Uh, but what this study does, I think, in, in that context offers is a solid uh, a database uh, on the realm of the possible within that, uh, within the, that, so those kinds of goals, both uh, the individual national plans and, and whatever plans NATO uh, hopes to uh, uh, pursue. So I think it'll be very useful, and I know already from some discussion with the NATO international staff and, and the military staffs there that they've really welcomed uh, this, uh, this uh, more detailed analysis, and particularly also looking at the uh, the, the industrial base side of this in, in tandem, uh, which is which is uh, centrally important uh, because of the notion of both what kind of capabilities can European countries sustain, and and what about the defense industrial base to support it, and and of course as uh, as you heard from David, I'm sure, and 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 the sort of the good news bad news part of this uh, report, or the glass half half empty half full part of it, the notion of the the not surprising and and continuing dismaying trends about the continuing. Uh, European disinvestment in defense uh, over the past decade and, and even going beyond uh, that if you look at some of the uh, previous studies uh, that both uh, CSIS and others have done uh, and, and, and NATO data that reflect, reflects the same thing that are contributing to uh, from a U.S. perspective of course to the, the widening gap in capabilities uh, with U.S. forces the compound uh, negative growth uh, that was cited at 1.8 percent oh, that's the bad news uh, but the two good news parts of this report, of course, are this notion, or at least the potential, the glass, the glass half empty of the notion that this per soldier uh, spending uh, has uh, ticked up a bit and, and uh, with the shrinking uh, size of the overall forces, leaving at least the potential uh, for countries devoting uh, more to, and developing more capable kinds of forces. Uh, smaller but more capable, and, and as Jim noted, but, but you know, the question of uh, capable of what and, and, and sustainable for how long. But also the, def the the general health of the defense industrial base that it suggests uh, uh, in Europe, and the and the uh, how the period of contraction and, and consolidation has actually left with a fairly uh, a fairly uh, healthy and and, and stable uh, defense industrial base. The question is, can it be orchestrated, of course, in a way, in a coherent way, to support, and and will it support defense programs that that have the kind of coherence and uh, and and um, and uh, achievability uh, in the context of the the scarce resources. Um, so I mean, we could dwell a lot on the on the um, on you know how this is uh, the the sort of the, the the bad news part of this and and the um, and how this uh, report or, uh, you know further amplifies many of the trends that that uh, have been uh, lamented by various U.S. defense secretaries or uh, or um, uh, in in various NATO communiques as as people uh, as governments were being urged to uh, to try to live up to the two percent goal of uh, two percent of GDP. Goal uh, as you as you look at uh, the general uh, trend that of course that that on average the uh, the uh, according to the NATO data over over the last uh, last 15 years or so the uh, the U.S. average being about 3.7 percent of GDP uh, based on current prices and with about a little less than 1.9 uh, for the for the core group of allies that, uh, that were all that were in the alliance during that period so. 
And of course, that all that all but four of, of our current allies who do uh, achieve that uh, two percent, and of course, the uh, the British. Uh, in their SDSR uh, a few weeks ago were very quick to underscore that they were still going to maintain that commitment based on on a number of other uh, specific initiatives that they were going to be taking and that they wouldn't fall below that below that mark. Not that it's a magic number, not that it is, is necessarily linked to any specific set of capabilities, but it is reflective of an overall level of capacity uh, going back to, to Jim's point about, well, um, uh, you know, what, what level of uh, uh, kinds of operations can various uh, governments sustain. And of course, the, the other big concern that has been out there for so long uh, within NATO, within the U.S. defense community of the, of the, of the gap in average spending on investment in R&D uh, that, that Europe uh, spends, uh, you know, that, uh, that the United States has had been outspending Europe about six to one in R&D uh, and devoting much higher percentages of, of uh, its uh, defense expenditures to uh, investment. Uh, from a budget of a much larger, uh, obviously a much larger base. And then Jim, too, alluded to, and, uh, and again, as I said, I want to I focus more about how we go, with, go forward in the world that we live in, not that we, the world that we wish we had, perhaps, um, the equally problematic gap on, on, the, on the sustainability uh, and the fact that um, with, uh, with still, you know, over uh, two million uh, uh, men under arms, uh, only about 3 percent, uh, 3 to 5 percent of those European forces are, are capable of deployment outside their territory, so still falling far short of the NATO uh, goals uh, of achieving about 50 percent that they're capable and prepared for foreign deployment, and about 10 percent of those land forces capable of being sustained in foreign operations. Um, so that that is uh, probably, and particularly as we look at the at the fiscal forecasts and the and the uh, growth forecasts in Europe uh, in the out years, um, at least over the next four to five years, uh, very unlikely that those goals are likely to be achieved either. At a time, though, when this new NATO strategic concept will call for uh, the development of more flexible and adaptable forces that are capable of being uh, both uh, uh, projected and sustained at some geographic distance, at strategic distance, as as the alliance. Uh, speaks of it. That is to say, more expectation that there will be more efforts to be engaged in remote uh, stabilization operations, uh, uh, not necessarily on the scale of Afghanistan, but certainly operations, complex contingencies like Afghanistan, perhaps on a smaller scale, uh, support to counter piracy and freedom of navigation activities, other kinds of uh, threats that are out there that the, that, the, that the group of experts that advising NATO on the strategic concept said that the broader threats to European security emanating from afar, from more distant uh, regions, uh, new threats uh, and, 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 uh, that, uh, that relate to uh, protection of the global commons or other areas that don't necessarily uh, pose direct threats to alliance territory but to alliance interests. Uh, and of course, new threats, uh, and NATO is, is uh, one of the things that the summit will do, has already been established but endorsed by the summit, is this uh, development of the new uh, division uh, in the international staff focused on emerging threats and, and focusing on how the alliance does better in dealing with uh, not only uh, terrorism and proliferation but also cyber and other threats. What is the, what is the, uh, what is the cap what are the role of the allied militaries and the alliance itself in, in, the, in some of those domains and how can that be made more effective? But all of that calling for a much more dynamic and, and adaptable and flexible force posture than, than uh, a number of the current legacy uh, forces uh, that we see in the European countries can sustain. So as I say, I thought it may be more useful to focus uh, uh, on a discussion of the, uh, the, the more positive part of the report, the trend that does this, this opening the door in particular of, to uh, having more capable smaller forces uh, among our allies and key European partners, and how um, how could what what ways could uh, could we encourage that, and what kinds of mechanisms would achieve, would it, would achieve the best value for money, which is was certainly what uh, uh, what was being emphasized uh, in the recent UK S uh, Strategic Defense and Security Review, what a number of other governments were at least talking about, uh, and and how enhanced uh, collaboration, more uh, common uh, funding within NATO, uh, multinational formations. Uh, 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 multi, uh, multinational procurement programs, 
could those in this context of will the, will the fiscal crisis serve as, as, a, as a stimulus to help overcome some of the traditional political hesitancies and other, uh, other financial and economic complications of those kinds of operations, uh, those kinds of cooperation uh, to, uh, uh, to advance uh, the, and the development of the kind of, of smaller and more capable forces that, uh, that, that we think are, are probably sustainable if you look at the trends even, even as this flat line does continue uh, in, in this, the out years uh, with regard to European spending. But uh, with these smaller forces, with the move of a number of countries to uh, away from conscription forces to professional militaries, uh, how can that be sustained? So um, I think the, the dig analysis does suggest that, that, uh, that this changing structure of demand and, and, uh, and the tendency towards these smaller uh, and more expeditionary capable forces is emerging, that there are, there are certainly, those are the trend lines, there are certain Im improvements in some key areas, a number of, a number of governments having made some um, specific investments in, in sp special operations and special operations like forces. Uh, and some of them having uh, rather uh, considerable capabilities in those areas, and and that uh, those relative spending priorities uh, could be uh, focused on giving priority, and and that is of course another one of the trends that that the dig uh, this present study has shown, that it is across uh, all of those other areas of equipment and as well as total defense spending that this uh, per soldier uh, that the um, that this per soldier or per uh, personnel investment has has been uh, has been uh, has been going up. Um, but still, there's the whole question, as I said, of, of the, uh, the many governments and the, and the British uh, tried to wrestle with this as they looked at their legacy force, both the British Army of the Rhine, still deployed in Germany, uh, the, some of the heavy tank forces, moving some of that equipment into the reserves. How could, uh, how could they uh, uh, begin to transition from the legacy forces, but at the same time, obviously, uh, meeting the challenge of, of, uh, of, of restoring and, uh, and replacing uh, worn-out equipment that has been taxed uh, by heavily uh, in recent current operations. Uh, but, but I think the UK SDSR does set a course, and I, I think this is why uh, you'll see that uh, you know, a number of our colleagues here, we gave a rather positive review to that review, uh, arguing that they made some very difficult choices, they made some, some hard calls, uh, but overall I think that they, they did make a, a nod in the direction of focusing on more transformational capabilities, uh, sustaining, uh, you know, providing a clear support for sustainment of current operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, but also uh, trying to move towards the investments uh, in the longer term that will provide a force that is, uh, that is uh, capable of, of some uh, long-range power projection, capable of sustaining, uh, at least in the British case, uh, at least a, a combat brigade fairly indefinitely in a long-term uh, long uh, mission of, of, uh, at, some, at some distance. Uh, so if the UK model is followed or emulated by a number of other countries as they go forward, either those that are already in the middle of various program laws or, or defense plans, uh, or as they undertake future reviews, uh, I, I think that, that the UK review offers some, some very good guidelines, and indeed, as, as a number of my colleagues here pointed out, also some lessons uh, that the U.S. could, could, uh, could uh, learn from uh, as it looks towards a, a more austere uh, fiscal environment in the defense sector. Um, there are uh, uh, so I, I think that um, I, I think that uh, you know there there are still some some key questions about um, you know what kind of resources though if you look even at the at the British uh, uh, assessments which have been the most uh, uh, complete and explicit if you look at that clear commitment to uh, sustaining uh, support for current operations in Afghanistan if you look at this issue of, of what will be required to to pr simply recapitalize uh, some of the forces that uh, that the kit is wearing out. Um, what what are the what are the capa what are, impact will this have on then the resources? How sustainable will uh, the continued growth that that the that the that the dig study has illuminated uh, is still out there for our equipment and R and D? Uh, how sustainable is that going to be over the coming years? I think those are, that's one of the big questions that I have. Uh, not at all evident that as you say, well, of course we you know, and, and any politically impossible for any government not to say that they're not going to provide adequate support to, to um, uh, forces in the field in active combat operations, uh, uh, and, and other than you know, re reducing that level of commitment, uh, then the notion is what, el what else is going to be left over as you look at these uh, continued shrinking uh, pies, uh, even, even on the smaller base that many of them are projecting. Um, 
the, uh, the, the whole question, though, of uh, this renewed focus, and I think, again, one of the, the good, uh, the, sort of the good news stories uh, that emerging from this, and, and we saw this even this week in the announcement of, of, some, of, uh, of some of the cooperation between the Fran France and the UK uh, uh, on uh, both, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the conventional sphere and also in, in their nuclear development, but the notion that, uh, that it does seem to be some evidence, at least, that uh, some of the uh, traditional uh, impediments to, uh, to, to bilateral cooperation among European allies uh, that also, too, we, we know very clearly that the, that the French and the UK both are looking towards continued cooperation with the U.S. as a way to sustain uh, the, some of the most capable forces within, within the alliance, either for ad hoc coalition operations or, or as part of a leadership role in, in NATO operations. But also we see other regional cooperation, Nordic cooperation. Jim mentioned Sweden uh, being increasingly active and wanting to play a role uh, in Nordic uh, Baltic security cooperation. A number of other regional consortia, of course, that are out there that we could, we could talk about. Uh, all of those kinds of capabilities will, will, will in fact, uh, the current fiscal environment be a stimulus to that to, to, uh, to enable uh, these governments to, to overcome some of the impediments that we know that uh, have oftentimes been difficult uh, in, uh, in, in, in multilateral uh, in multinational cooperation or in, uh, in uh, uh, multilateral procurement programs. Um, but uh, so I, I think those are, those are some of the questions, those are some of the uh, unknowns at this point, but, but some of the key questions that will, will, uh, will I think, answer the uh, or, or uh, prove out the, uh, the question that the, that the DIG study asks is uh, as they have uh, this um, uh, greater uh, resources available per individual soldier and airman and seaman, what, uh, what kinds of, uh, how will those, will they in fact be spent smartly? Uh, will there in fact be efforts to uh, achieve the kind of cooperation and, and rationalization uh, of force structures so that not, and particularly in a NATO context, the hard decisions that maybe some countries will make to say that, well, they're not going to maintain a full spectrum of forces, that they're going to begin to specialize within a, within a certain range, leaving still open some capacity for national action, but uh, independent national action, but, but also uh, moving towards a, um, uh, a more specialized force that is, that is then uh, a more sustainable. So I probably should stop there, and, and uh, we can open the floor to, to discussion and other comments. Um, thank you, Steve. I, I appreciate those very thorough uh, commentary along the way. I would like to make three points before I open up the floor to questions um, in response to the comments both from Jim Townsend and from Dr. Flanagan. Um, one is that absolutely the first minute we can predict where Europe's going to be five years from now, we're going to print that report and distribute it to all of you. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the reasons we look so hard at the information is to see whether or not there's trends that we can lean forward here. I think the inflection point that we're at right now makes it very difficult to predict uh, where we're going to go. The second is really, I think, you, you have to look at the political dynamic that's happened in Europe over the last decade. For the first time in a long time, many of these countries have actually deployed their young men and women into combat environments, and they've come home dead. And this has been a dramatic change for a lot of European countries. And the ways in which they both have responded and will continue to respond are to some extent independent of the finances. Uh, and, you know, there's a tendency in face with that situation to, to react in one of two ways. One is to say, okay, we're going to quit sending them because it's too dangerous. Because the reality is that an awful lot of European soldiers ended up without the same capability to survive in the hostile combat environment that U.S. soldiers had. And their parents asked legitimately, why not? How come ours aren't as well protected? And it's not just a question of body armor and Humvees. This is a question of sensors and data. Uh, it's a question of situational awareness. It's a question of, of organizations and training. It's a question of the entire way in which you approach uh, military operations. Because the other side of that equation is the geopolitics of the future may not permit you the luxury of not engaging. And I think most of the European countries have faced that and are continuing to face that dynamic. So it's not just a question of money and technology and expenditures. It's also a question of both political will and the geopolitical reality of the, of the future. Um, and then the third comment, I think, and Steve really raised this point very, very interestingly. To what extent are we in the U.S. going to look at Europe and see ourselves in, in our own future? Both what lessons do we learn from that and how do we apply those lessons and what's the reality of what we're facing? So those are questions that are really above and beyond the nature of our report. 
but I think they all shape and frame the way in which we look at the data and the way in which we project forward from the data. I want to pick up on your point, uh, at the, uh, David, about uh, you can't predict the budget five years in the future. Um, what I'd like to ask the following kind let's pretend that we're having this meeting in 2022 or 2025. And you're talking about how the European defense industrial base evolved over the intervening 10 to 12 years. It's obvious that there are some alternative ways that that base could go. <clears throat> and it may move a lot faster than the U.S. base will go. And it will be hinged on things like, well, you can see the indications today. There are, there are what I will call macho industrial base uh, issues like uh, no self-respecting force. when we talk about the last. Let me take a first crack at that, Steve, and you can uh, be thinking about it while I, while I ramble a bit here. Um, I, I think it is a fairly binary set of options that, that we face. And of course, you know, let, let, let's just pick 2025. I mean, that, that seems like an awful long way uh, into the future. Uh, but if you go the same distance back, it's 1995, and you say, okay, how much different are we now today than we were in 1995? And the reality is not all that much. Um, maybe in terms of threat environment, we're dramatically different. And in terms of parts of the world we can ignore, we're dramatically different. But in terms of distribution of labor, fundamental capabilities and options available to us, and the industry that supports it, um, it there's not a lot of dramatic change. But I think the binary path that we go down is, is one that, that's very clearly laid out here. Uh, absent any conscious decisions to the contrary, what we're going to end up with is, uh, at the national level in Europe, very limited capability on a country-by-country -country basis, and it will still be platform-centric. Um, at the industry level, it's already evolved to a very export-dependent industry uh, in, in a way that we don't yet see here in the U.S., but that may be the, the future that, uh, that we're looking at here as well. I actually don't think so because I think the U.S. will continue to be uh, the biggest market. Um, the other option that sits there, and this is an option that won't be decided by the companies themselves, is an option that focuses more on integration of technology. It's less platform specific, and it has a greater transatlantic integration in, in terms of technology capability. Um, those, two di those two futures are very, very different, and I don't actually see uh, right now the political will to uh, steer towards that second future. Uh, the market itself won't do it. These are national decisions and, 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 and alliance decisions that have to be made. Thanks, Chip. Good to see you. And it's, it's, no, it's an excellent question. And I, I, I think it's, as David said, you know, if we, uh, if, if we could predict that, uh, that five years, they'd be, it'd be quick to get it out uh, before anybody else did. But, but I, think, I think if you look at the, the sense of, uh, you know, as our, in our own uh, defense analysis, uh, we've done a looking at shocks and trends and what could, could shape or alter perceptions. I mean, if you look back, uh, you look back at the uh, NATO's discussions in 1999 about its strategic concept that was, you know, that is, is still in place that will be, uh, it was fairly focused on, on uh, developing, making the transition from, a, from the legacy force for defense of Central Europe towards, um, towards uh, engagement in uh, not so distant uh, stabilization and reconstruction missions of, of adopting peacekeeping and, and, and engagement with other partners as a, as a, as a long-term concept. And, and now, uh, no one certainly anticipated the notion of the idea that NATO would, would deploy, you know, in excess of 100,000 troops in Central Asia. No one was talking about this kind of longer-term sustainment, about kind of piracy operations, all these other kinds of things that... And now, uh, you see, uh, you know, we still have 40,000 European troops deployed in Afghanistan for a long period, a point that even Secretary Gates, when he made his rather pointed speech about demilitarization of, of European thinking and, and capabilities in, uh, in February, even he pointed out it's, remarka it's a remarkable achievement that even with all the caveats, with all the limitations, uh, still, and you know, they were taking uh, a, a fairly high proportion of the casualties, as David alluded to, there was still that engagement. So um, I think it's hard to know, will, what would, would there be galvanizing events? Uh, the whole question of missile defense, which is now going to become a prominent 
uh, feature of the of the debate at the NATO strategic concepts and um, uh, in, in the finalization of the concept at the summit. Um, what what would be the reaction? Uh, clearly, uh, the coalition uh, of the uh, the P5 plus two is stuck together uh, on uh, on aspects of uh, of pushing on Iran. Now uh, the alliance has a clear decision to make about, and it looks like it will endorse the notion of of uh, uh, defensive population uh, for all of the alliance as a as a as a core mission. Uh, how will the alliance, and, and will that begin to soak up a lot of resources? I mean, that's another, if, if there were a couple of uh, missiles lobbed uh, by the Iranians at, uh, at Israel or other countries in the region, um, you know, how would, uh, you know, looking out five years or further, how would the allies react? Would there be a new resolve to about, uh, or would there be an impetus to focus more on homeland security and, and societal security, is, uh, which, which, is, which is indeed one of the things that the UK uh, Defense uh, Review did did highlight and, and emphasize that there was a need to put more effort in there, uh, in that. But but would that include missile defense? Would it include other capabilities? How much? What what balance will they see between you know fighting, uh, uh, preventing threats from reaching our shores versus uh, dealing with threats uh, once they do uh, emerge uh, f more full blown on our shores? So, so I think I'll, I'll, I think in some ways a, a lot of international trends and sh and and potential shocks could. You know, could uh, impact that. So it's, uh, but but I think that the baseline that we see is probably a, you know, in all likelihood a fairly uh, limited. I mean, in the discussions that the NATO group of experts had this year and a lot of the seminars that were held, that, which I participated in, a lot of the discussion was on the notion, the, certainly the expectation that for the next four to five years, NATO could expect to be engaged in uh, operations like Afghanistan, not not nearly on that magnitude, but that that's what the Allies needed to at least aim for, were they, would they be able to sustain those capabilities, but complex contingencies, developing integrated civil military approaches, uh, the so-called comprehensive approach as NATO calls it, or networked approach as the Germans call it, uh, doing, you know, sort of all the lessons of Afghanistan uh, and applying those, but, you know, and, 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 uh, and hopefully uh, for, for many allies because of their inability to sustain it, hopefully on a much smaller scale uh, than what was, uh, that is, what has become the, the current mission in Afghanistan. So uh, I think that that's the sort of the baseline that many allies think they're moving towards, but, but now worried about, you know, if they make this commitment to missile defense, what kind of implications will that have for uh, what's the, what's the, yeah, it's only 200 million for the command and control system, but what are the other investments going to be down the road? Uh, how much how much capability are we going to need to have something effective if the threat is greater than than uh, than a few uh, you know dozens of missiles if it what if it becomes a hundred missiles um, what are we what are we going to do then so I, I think this um, I think there's still a hesitancy it's not it's not certainly a robust engagement uh, of most of those governments on on uh, of, um, a robust embrace of global engagement but I do think there is a recognition uh, at least at the at the level of of the defense establishments in those countries, that uh, the, that uh, their their uh, their militaries have to be prepared for, uh, and if you look at the French white paper in 2008, uh, the same kind of conclusions: a, a much more flexible, adaptable kind of force posture, capable of some uh, projection capability at distance. Uh, and then how sustainable is that? Well, it's not sustainable, clearly, on a national basis. So is it going to is it going to overcome some of these impediments to uh, more uh, multinational cooperation? Arno. Arno de Borgraf, CSIS. What procurement, um, common procurement programs have uh, been adopted in Europe between uh, like minded neighbors uh, such as Belgium and Holland? I don't have a good catalog of, uh, of, of those kinds of, of programs, uh, but I think the fact that they haven't really come to our attention as we've looked at them tells me there aren't very many. Um, and, and from a transatlantic point of view, of course, there are even fewer. And one of the great challenges that we face is that the few that we have don't seem to be doing quite as well as we would like them to do. Uh, and so the, that, that tends to raise the spectra of, uh, of uh, cost overruns, schedule slippages, et cetera, that you commonly have in defense programs. And that leads then to pressure to say, well, can't we just get rid of that? But the value of a transatlantic cooperation or a cross-national cooperation uh, has to be taken into account as part of that equation. I think with that, 
it's uh, we're close to our 10 o'clock hour. I think uh, you all would be happy to spend the rest of your day reading this report. Um, we'll be we'll be happy. It, it'll be of course uh, posted on our website, and uh, and we eagerly uh, uh, request your reactions and inputs and insights as we go forward. We'll continue to be monitoring this and uh, and trying to expand our coverage. And, uh, and our prediction capabilities uh, as well. I want to thank you all for being here this morning, and thank you for your interest in this topic.